Thank you very much. Um, so the work I'm going to discuss today is done in collaboration with a, I guess, medium large group of people, uh, several of whom are here. Uh, Lou Lello is there and Steve Avery is there. So uh, I don't know if Gustavo or Anna are here. No, okay. So it's done in collaboration with these people. Um, I first want to answer the question, why is somebody who's main background is theoretical physics doing uh, genomics, and the easiest answer is just to look at this curve. This is a cost curve for uh, genotyping and sequencing. And when I started getting involved in this area, it was sort of here, but the trend was very apparent. And this is a super exponential curve, so it's, it's, it's benchmarked here versus Moore's Law. So Moore's Law is merely an exponential curve. This is a super exponential curve. And uh, if you're as old as I am, you remember a time when bandwidth was really expensive. Like you had to buy a, a thing called a modem and you would put your phone receiver into the modem just to get a few bits per second. And at that time, people used to say, oh, someday bandwidth will be too cheap to meter. It'll just be so available that, wow, people will just watch stupid videos uh, for free uh, on their computer all day long or on their phone when they're bored. And we are approaching the era where genotyping is almost, not quite, but almost too cheap to meter. So in the sense that millions of people per year now are paying 23andMe and similar companies to have their genotypes done. There are many projects on the books or in planning which involve millions of genotype, genotypes of millions of individuals. And the data set that I'm gonna describe here, the analysis of, is about half a million people. So we're kind of approaching this future where there really is a ton of genotype data. And uh, my prediction is that this field is going to really advance uh, tremendously in the next five or 10 years. So if you're a young person, you're interested in uh, an interesting set of problems, uh, this is one area where uh, you might choose to look. So now I have a little bit of a review for people. I realize this is not a, an audience of specialists. And so I, I want to say, I want to encourage uh, people to ask questions. So please don't wait till the end to ask a question. If you see something on a slide or I say something which is puzzling to you, I'm, I guarantee you you're not the only person who finds it confusing. Just raise your hand and, and I will happily answer your question. And I just feel that seminars go much better when people are asking a lot of questions. And in fact, if you think back to the hundreds of seminars that you've been to, most of the time, if it's a bad seminar, it's because there weren't enough questions and the speaker went too fast. It's almost never the case that the speaker went too slow and there were too many questions. That's, that's almost never the case. So always err on the side of asking more questions is what I tell people. Okay, so uh, let's imagine that uh, you, could, uh, you had in front of you your entire genome. And so that's comprised of about three billion base pairs. And all the information that goes into the basic uh, plan that builds you, I, I don't want to say code because it's not the right, exactly the right analogy, but it's not that bad. So we'll, maybe we could say three billion base pairs forms the kind of code uh, that uh, is used to build you. Now, um, if you take any two people in this room, they're very similar. So if I, if I compare my genome to Lou's genome, even though he has bright orange hair, um, we only differ at about one per thousand base pairs. So if you just randomly chose a particular location on his genome and my genome, the chances that we would differ at that locus is only about one in a thousand, okay? And furthermore, there are specific places in the genome where there is common variation, where if you look in that place, the probability that I and somebody else will differ is, is high, like 50% or 30% or 10%. So those are the places where there's so-called common variation, common variation as opposed to places where actually uh, people could be all the same and really fixed, so that if you, if, you, if you change something there, you really break something bad, and people, so people never change, people never have uh, different uh, information at that particular locus. So in your head, you should think uh, 10 to the nine total base pairs, but the variation between humans is only about 10 to the minus three, so you could compress all the information into a few megabytes if you had to. Um, and so what people have done, um, uh, is they've identified the roughly million or few million, million places in the genome that are most likely to have variation. So if you want to study individual differences, so why is one person tall and one person short, or one person has orange hair and one person has black hair, um, 
what's causing that, you would, first place you might want to look if you were on a limited budget is you would try to measure those places where the genomes are most likely to be different because maybe that's what's accounting for the, the phenotypic differences, okay? So think of these single nucleotide, nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs as an informative uh, efficient sampling of the whole genome. It's not the whole genome, but it's a sampling of the whole genome. Current cost to get a SNP genotype for an individual is actually getting down to $25, $30 at large volume per person, whereas whole genome costs have gone down to maybe $800,000, $800, but there's still maybe a factor of um, at least 20 difference between the two. So although I would rather have the whole genome of somebody that's in our study, I would not want to pay 20x to get the whole genome. At some fixed budget, it is much more cost effective to get uh, many, many SNP genotypes than to get a much smaller number of whole genomes. Okay. Now, you may remember, again, if you're old like me, you may remember a big fanfare around the turn of the century about the Human Genome Project. We, we you know, we, we, oh, we read out the whole human genome, well, of one person. Um, what a great breakthrough, nothing will be the same again. Well, I would actually claim that the, the true decoding, the actual decoding of what the information in the genome does is happening now. It's only happening now. And obviously, if you stick one second to think about it, you're, you're talking about the most complex machines that we know of in the universe. They're being built from very short samples of code. Uh, surely the programming language or the, the way in which that code is translated into the being is really complex. And the only way we have to get at it is primarily statistical tools. So therefore, you're not really going to be able to do this decoding until you get very, very large data sets. Um, part of the theoretical work that we've done in this area is actually to characterize how much data you need to really advance in this subject. So in a way, our group is kind of working at a slightly higher level of ab abstraction, I would say, than most people in this field. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. OK, so let's suppose you have a quantitative phenotype. Quantitative means you can measure it in some units, um, maybe to some precision. Phenotype means it's an aspect of an individual organism, okay? And uh, so here I have a function Y. So Y stands for that phenotype. And the example that I'll use in the talk, I'll keep using this example just because it's the easiest one to think about, is, is human height, which is highly heritable. Um, it's heavily influenced by genetics, as long as the person that you're looking at has had a good environment to grow up in. Um, and it's easy to measure. And furthermore, it's often measured in any kind of study where they gather some data about people. Measuring their height is pretty easy. In fact, even self-reported height tends to be pretty accurate, although men tend to lie by about an inch or something. Um, so think of Y as the height of the individual. And think of G sub I uh, as a list of the values uh, for each common variant, each polymorphism that we're able to measure for that individual, okay? So um, if I have a, if you go to 23andMe and you pay them 100 bucks, then they'll give you back this, uh, I think maybe 500,000 SNP list of which variant you have at each of one of those 500,000 uh, locations on your genome, and uh, let I label the number, let I run from one to 500,000, so it specifies the state of each of those SNPs, yeah. So, so are the Gs a real variable or a uh, semi-positive? Uh, so, very good. So G is not a continu okay, so initially G is not a continuous variable. And it's very funny because I gave this talk at the Institute for Advanced Study about a month ago, and uh, Ed Witten and I got into this big discussion about exactly what is meant by the state of G. And so I realized I wasn't being concrete enough because he was obviously following things very carefully, and he, he, was, he wanted to know really what is G. Okay, so when you, when you read out a SNP genotype, you either get a zero, one, or two. Okay, and the encoding is a little bit arbitrary, but let's suppose this zero means that you have both copies in your genome of the common variant. Let one be, you have one rare and one common variant, and two means you have both rare variants. Okay, so that's the fundamental readout that you get from the genotyping array. But then in all of our analysis, everything is gonna be uh, standardized. So we're going to shift relative to the population mean, and then we're gonna divide by the population standard deviation. So what started out as zero of ones and twos will be some other very sort of continuous looking variables after that, okay? 
but uh, it is a definite number, and for every person, there's sort of, with, with uh, genotyping that we're talking about, there are basically three possibilities. Okay. Um, why do you include a, why do you include a some, uh, some variable in terms of the, the genotype of it? I'm sorry? Why the, the gene, the gene of it? Like the genes. So G represents the G sub I for a fixed I is the value of a particular individual's genome, genotype, at that particular locus, I. Does that make sense? So, okay, so we're reading out a million loci from your genome. Oh, I runs from one to a million. Oh, I tried to ask why we put some phenotype of it. The phenotype? The phenotype is Y. So Y would be like 183 centimeters, or if you Z-score, once you Z-score it, then it's sort of plus 1.2, or plus 1.4, or minus 1.2. Some other phenotype you can put any phenotype you want here, uh, as long as you can quantify it. For, for this formalism, it has to be something you can quantify. Okay. Um, so, uh, where was I? Okay, so, so G is the uh, genotype of the individual. Now, these are the things that we're trying to figure out. What are the effect sizes of, you know, what, how does having a variant A versus variant B at a particular locus, how does that affect the phenotype? And for most loci in the genome, there's not going to be a measurable effect. So it turns out that if you have a million, if you sample it a million places, even the most complex phenotypes, which maybe depend on say 10,000 or 20,000 individual loci, um, will not depend on all one million. So most values, most components of this vector X are gonna be zero, okay? And there's some number of non-zero ones. And for the non-zero ones, uh, that would mean that having one version of the, 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 the SNP uh, at, at locus I either makes you slightly taller or makes you slightly uh, shorter. Okay, and we're trying to actually extract those values of X. Okay? Now, obviously this could be a nonlinear function of G, and so we have to include the possibility that, for example, you could have gene-by-gene -gene interactions or gene-cubed interactions, and of course there's going to be some environmental noise involved here. Okay? So from a mathematical standpoint, this is almost a kind of trivial model. It's like this incredibly simple model. Um, one interesting aspect of it is that it's well known that the linear term actually, in many cases, in, in almost all known cases actually, gives the largest component of variance. In other words, if you could only fit, if you could only extract the terms in the linear part of the model, you would already do quite well. And uh, in agriculture, this is actually applied quite a bit in both the breeding of animals and the breeding of plants. Okay. So the goal here uh, is to extract these effect sizes, which really describe the genetic architecture uh, of the trait. And today, actually, all I'm going to talk about, although we've done some work in extracting things like Z, uh, everything I'm going to talk about today is just extracting these values X. Question. Steve, back to G, it sounds like you are encoding them so that they're only the common variant and an uncommon variant, even though there are multiple var actual variants. Um, so for so SNPs are chosen, uh, the, so the particular thing, single nucleotide polymorphism, they're chosen so there are just two variants. Okay, so just effectively just think there's just two variants. Okay. okay. So what is the technique for solving an equation like this? I'm, I'm gonna measure the phenotype value for each individual in the population, and I'm gonna measure the genome, the genotype information for each individual. I'm trying to extract these values X, and my enemy is some random noise terms. Okay, so very simple model. Um, what do we have going for us? We have going for us that X is sparse, as I just explained. Even if uh, the trait is extremely complex, where you say have 10,000 causal variants or 20,000 causal variants, uh, still most of the components of this vector X are gonna be zero if, if you consider it as a fraction of, say, a million SNPs. Um, typically, this is an underdetermined problem, so the set of possible uh, variants that uh, could have non-zero effect sizes is quite large, and that's usually larger than the number of individuals that you have in your sample. And, the method that we're going to talk about today is something called compressed sensing. And basically, uh, if you've taken even an elementary statistics course, you probably know what this is. It's, it's, it's also referred to as something called lasso. And basically what we're going to use is something called an L1 norm, which penalizes the objective function and enforces sparsity. So it, it encodes or it enforces this prior uh, that X is gonna be rather sparse. 
Now, um, compressed sensing has been the uh, subject of very intense investigation in the last, I don't know, maybe 10 or 20 years. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit about that uh, in a minute. Um, one of the main results is that the amount of data that you need to actually solve this problem uh, grows linearly with S, but only logarithmically with P. Okay, and that's actually a very uh, typical situation in machine learning, because the actual amount of information that you're trying to determine here is basically proportional to S. But the stuff that you have to disqualify as uh, having some uh, non-zero effect, that grows with P, but your, your, your uh, sensitivity to that is only logarithmic in P. <coughs> basically because you're, as you accumulate data, you're able to sort of suppress the, um, the variants that aren't gonna have an effect exponentially. And so uh, having a lot of them isn't actually that big a deal. They only, they only uh, cause you to have to increase your data sample size by a logarithm. Okay, so here's a picture of the problem we're trying to solve. Ignore this notation, I, I stole this picture from somebody on the, on the web. So um, this is a list of phenotype values. Uh, if this is me, uh, then my Y would be, I don't know, 183 centimeters, and if you Z-score me, I don't know what I would be, like plus one point something, okay? And uh, this would be the elements of my genotype, this row. And the thing that we're trying to uh, extract is these blue values in the vector X, which are the non-zero components of X, and all the other values are zero, okay? It, it, and again, mathematically, this looks like a completely trivial problem, but if you could write down uh, this list of 10,000 values or 20,000 values with the actual numbers that should occur in here, you would have a predictor for a complex phenotype. And by just measuring the genotype of an individual, you would then be able to predict with some accuracy uh, what that phenotype is for the person. Um, at the risk of uh, giving away the, the punchline, uh, I guess I gave it away in the abstract, the height predictor that we managed to build has an uncertainty of about three centimeters. So in other words, if you just give me a DNA sample from somebody in this room, but you never let me meet that person or see that person, we just run our code on the genotype for that person, we can estimate their height plus or minus about a little over an inch, okay? And, I, yeah? Just, what's the reference population? So the reference population that the predictor is trained on is 500,000 Brits, all of filtered so that it's all Brits of primarily European heritage. Um, now, just uh, socio sociology of science comment. Um, if you would ask people a year ago, or six months ago, or even today if you go to the right place, uh, and you, you, you say, go to office where it's labeled genomics expert. So just find an office at some university that says genomics expert. And you go inside and start talking to that person. Six months ago, or even today, if it's the right person, um, they'll say, oh, that's impossible. No, you'll never be able to do that. Height is so complex. Think about how complex it is. Metabolism, it's something that is manifested over maybe 18 years of development. Mm -hmm. There's bone issues, deposits of calcium, protein, digestation, whatever it is, okay? They'll give you all these reasons why this problem is too complex to solve. And yet, it has been solved. And the same kind of argument will be given to you if, you, if a year ago, if you, or two years ago, if you said, well, this my middle machine running on my phone is gonna beat you in Go. In fact, it'll beat the best human that's ever played Go. A couple years ago, people would just said, that's insane. You'll never be able to do that. It's too complicated, okay? So the thing to remember is that uh, if you want to study the progress of science carefully, you have to register what people are actually saying. Because once it's been done, everyone in hindsight will say, well, yeah, that's kind of obvious when well, you can do height, but you, I'm sure you cannot do heart disease. Heart disease is way more complicated than height. You can't do heart disease. So we're in that phase now. So if you ask Lou or Steve or myself what kind of discussions we're having with other people in this field, now they're ready to say, oh, you can do height. Ah, uh, you can do bone density. We have a bone density predictor as well. Um, but you'll never be able to do cognitive ability. Cognitive ability is too hard. So um, just watch as the, as the skeptics get crushed uh, and, <laughs> and progress continues. Okay, so what is the reason why you want an L1 penalization? And so if, you, if you're familiar with compressed sensing, you already know all this, but uh, maybe this is useful for some people. I'll just go through it quickly. So if you consider uh, a problem in which you're trying to minimize the uh, norm squared error, so you take the sum of the squares of deviation between your prediction and the actual values, and, and so you want some uh, goodness of that 
of that prediction. Um, but then you impose some other condition, like you want to minimize uh, the LP norm of the vector x, where p could be some number like uh, 0.1 or 1 or 2. It turns out that uh, choosing p is a trade-off between um, small values of p, which clearly enforce sparsity. They actually uh, do a good job of forcing the vector x to be sparse, but uh, finding the minimum once you include a term like that is extremely hard. Um, and uh, uh, if you include some other kind of penalization, you're not guaranteed to have sparsity, but of course it's relatively easy to solve that problem. And the sort of um, best middle ground is, uh, it turns out, when p is 1, because when p is 1, you both uh, have an overwhelmingly high probability of enforcing sparsity, but you also uh, end up with an objective function which is convex, and so it's relatively simple to minimize. And that's why there's been so much attention to compressed sensing, which is just L1 penalized uh, optimization. People are very interested in this particular set of algorithms because they combine these two characteristics. And there are very powerful theorems that have been proven by very famous people uh, concerning the performance of uh, this kind of uh, algorithm. Okay. So the objective function that we're trying to optimize is the following. Um, this is the L2 error. This is the genotype matrix. Uh, this is a candidate effects vector x. And then we have a penalization term here which measures the L1 norm, or the sum of the absolute values of the components of x. And, and that penalizes the uh, objective function. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, the um, expected amount of data that you need to solve this problem scales proportional to s. And what's interesting, so it's sort of s log p, but the interesting question is what is that coefficient? So, it, yeah. so s is the initial number of features you have in the Correct. Matrix, or is the one that you... No, you it, it's, it's, so there's some hidden model that you don't know, but you're trying to get it. And s is the number of non-zero components of x in that hidden model. Oh, in the hidden. Okay. Yeah, so it's the ultimate thing that you're trying to determine. So it's the real number. Of Correct. And um, so, from a sort of the from a higher level abstraction, the, the key question that you have, and this was my question when I was entering this field, because um, having worked on things like finding the Higgs boson, finding the dark energy, um, asking whether black holes destroy quantum information, I wanted to work on something that I felt could be solved before I die. Uh, <laughs> actually, the Higgs boson did get solved, but the reason why the Higgs boson is light, which was our whole reason for building these billion dollar $10 billion accelerators, we don't, still don't know the answer to that. So, so the reason I was intensely interested in this level of abstraction was because I wanted to look before I leapt, before I leaped. I wanted to say, if I'm gonna work on this genomic stuff, I don't wanna work on something where you just spend 30 years and you make no progress. I wanted to work on something where I could kind of guess where the progress was gonna come and that looking at that cost curve, it was reasonable that we're gonna get there. And so um, that all boils down to asking the question, there's some critical data threshold to solve this model. The amount of data you need is a coefficient times S log P. S I can kind of estimate, P I know, what is that coefficient? And it turns out to get that coefficient, uh, you use a very cool property of uh, this kind of algorithm, which is a, in physics we would call it a phase transition behavior. Anyone who's familiar with high dimensional statistics knows that um, this kind of behavior is quite common. So as, as the dimensionality goes to infinity, you can have very abrupt changes in the characteristic of some optimization procedure. And that's what uh, we're gonna talk about now. So um, it turns out the coefficient uh, that we want to know um, is about 30. So for P of order a million uh, and for a given phenotype with some value of S, the amount of data that you need to, quote, solve it is roughly order 30 times s. And, and I'll explain to you now how we know that. Oh, and I, I should say, this is for a particular amount of heritability. So uh, just for benchmarking, let's suppose we have a trait in which half the variance is genetic uh, due to these SNPs, and then half is some other stuff. Okay, that's, that's, what the, that's the case for height. Okay, so this phase transition is so famous it has a name. It's named after Donahoe, who's a professor at Stanford, and one of his former students named Tanner. I think Tanner's at Oxford now or something. Um, so uh, what is the Donahoe-Tanner phase transition? So these guys were interested in compressed sensing. Um, they started looking at problems in compressed sensing in which the 
what, um, in compressed sensing, that big matrix, which in our case is a matrix of genomes, in the compressed sensing context, it's just some probe matrix. It's a sensing matrix. They, that's what they call it. And these guys were interested in random matrices. So choose your favorite random, random matrices, like values of 0 and 1, randomly distributed, or maybe a Gaussian random matrix. Obviously, if you're mathematically inclined, you can make up whatever classes of random matrices you want. Um, these guys were interested in the following problem. I have a random matrix. Maybe there's some noise. I have an effects vector with some sparsity s. How much data do I need to solve that problem, to, to invert the problem and figure out what x is? Okay, that's exactly the problem we want to solve. So these guys did a bunch of simulations, and they always found, they found for very broad classes of random matrices, they found this kind of phase transition. Okay, so let me explain what this is. The variable rho is the ratio between the sparsity and the amount of data that you have. This parameter delta is the ratio between the amount of data that you have and p, which is the number of the total number of features, potential features. Okay? So it's natural to scale in this way to think in terms of those rescaled variables. And so as you accumulate data, rho gets smaller and delta gets bigger. So you traverse this graph kind of in this diagonal way. You start from this region, which is really bad, it turns out, and you head toward a region which is really good. And there's a very sharp behavior uh, right here. And it turns out, it, as you cross this uh, boundary, the support of the vector x, so not the specific values of each non-zero entry, but the, the positions of those entries becomes apparent. So when you first cross this boundary, you can quickly identify the support of x. You don't know the exact values of the coefficients, but as you go deeper in here, then you get the, you get the actual values, okay? That, that is the result that Donahoe and Tanner found, and they found it for a very large class of random matrices. However, one class of random matrices, which they did not get the result for, and which no one could get the result for until a few years ago, was matrices made of human genomes. Why? Because although matrices of human genomes are random, there's much of random SNPs in there, there are massive correlations in it. Not just within my genome, so my, you know, my genome obviously has lots of correlations, like the variant that I have here is actually somewhat correlated to the variant that I have here, but also the variants I have are correlated to the variants he has. So you're talking about a matrix with properties which are very hard for a pure mathematician to characterize. You cannot just characterize it by saying, oh, I take a draw from this urn, or I take a draw from this Gaussian distribution. You can't do that. Um, I made a little joke at the Institute about all theorems all complex theorems after like uh, Pythagoras uh, are actually not usable in the real world, okay? I got a big laugh at the Institute. Uh, so, but this is one of those cases where you can, you can look up thousands of pages of papers written on compressed sensing with beautiful theorems and performance guarantees and all kinds of things. None of them apply, strictly speaking, to genomes, okay? So a few years ago, I and some collaborators got a hold of 10 or 20,000 genomes. So we made some big 20,000 dimensional matrices. And we started doing simulations to see uh, to basically what Donna and Tanner had checked, but in this case for the matrices that we really cared about. And we produced this, we reproduced this curve exactly. Okay? So in physicist speak, um, matrices of human genomes are in the same universality class as Gaussian random matrices for purposes of this phase transition. Okay? So nice result. Uh, only we cared about it. No one else in the field of genomics understood what we were talking about. Um, but at that time, because we had these results, we could predict how much data it would take to solve some trait like height. We made those predictions several years ago, and those predictions are all true, and I'll show you the results. Okay. Now, one point of clarification. Uh, this is for the noiseless case. So what Donahoe and uh, Tanner mainly studied was the noiseless case. Once you start adding noise, the phase boundary is no longer here. It's actually way down here. Okay, and it gets pushed down the more noise you have. And so the 30S result that we're talking about is for a case where half of the phenotype is determined, half of the variance in the phenotype is determined by the genes, but the other half is pure noise. Okay, and that's the, that's the value that you actually care about. It turns out the critical value of um, rho that you need to get to is about 1 30th. Okay, it's about 1 30th, so it's 0.03 on this graph, you can't even really see the blue good region here, but it's down there. And so if you go down to row of 1 30th or less, uh, you'll cross that boundary, you'll get good results, and that corresponds to an n of order 30s. Okay, and so that, that, that's what, how you can predict all these things. Yes? 
where does the number 30 come from? What, how do I take 0.5 and you know this is it, it comes out of the simulation. So basically, if you, if you ask, so if I could blow up this region of small row on this graph, and you could look at it, and you could ask, as we scan down, uh, as we scan down this diagram, at what point do we get the proper support of x? So there's always some candidate vector that the optimization finds. And up here, it's a just lousy. It's lousy, 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 lousy. And then there's always this, there's a sharp behavior, somewhat sharp behavior, and then you get the real thing at least the support of the real thing. The actual values are not right. You need to go even lower to get precise uh, values. But uh, you can see where that phase boundary is. And the phase boundary, again, this is kind of rescaled. This is sort of scaled, rescaled universal behavior. So it's always happening at about, for, for this choice of noise level, it's always happening at about row equals 1 30th. So that's how you get it. So it comes out of a simulation, basically. But using real genomes. OK. Um, this is kind of for experts who are in the field, but I just want to make the distinction between, so GWAS is the main kind of activity that's done uh, in this field. It's people just collecting huge amounts of genomic data and then looking for uh, statistical correlations between um, variation at a particular locus and a slight change in the phenotype. And so what the, uh, GWAS stands for Genome-Wide Association Study. So you're trying to find the individual SNPs that are associated with the phenotype, and you generally conclude that with some confidence level, which is given by something called a p-value. Okay. And uh, the field has arrived at a um, criterion of p less than 5, 10 to the minus 8. So if you, if you can get a result which is um, with p-value less than 5, 10 to the minus 8, that's considered genome-wide significant. And this number just comes from a kind of arbitrary thing. It's like, Instead of p less than 0.05, which you might remember in some fields, they get a, they're able to claim a result with p less than 0.05. But here you have to remember you're testing potentially like a million different independent uh, SNPs. So if you just naively correct that p less than 10 to the minus five, uh, p less than 0.05 by this 10 to the minus six, which is the million uh, multiple testing factor, then you get this threshold. And the community has basically kind of decided that this is a good threshold. And in fact, studies uh, results which are established at this level of statistical significance routinely replicate. So in other words, if I do a study of diabetes and I find this particular SNP is associated with the, your chances of having diabetes and I can establish it at this p-value or less, chances are very good that when another group goes and does a study on a completely different population, they will also find a statistically significant result and so the result replicates. For many years, uh, the field was kind of in chaos because people were allowed to publish at p less than 0.05, and then nothing, nothing from that era replicates. In fact, you can, there's a whole, there's a series of papers that are, you know, in some five-year window, which you can literally just throw all of them in the trash, because none of them will replicate, almost none of them will replicate. Um, what we're doing here is quite different from that. We are not trying to establish at super high confidence that one particular SNP is associated with the phenotype. Rather, we are trying to solve the following problem. You give me a chunk of data, hopefully it's enough data that I'm on the good side of the phase transition, and I just want to try to build the best predictor I can from that data. And I'm willing to tolerate some false positives. So if my predictor, act, I, I do this crazy optimization and I activate 20,000 SNPs, maybe 1,000 of those SNPs are false positives. Maybe they actually do nothing. Okay, they, they're not actually biologically related to the trait. But I don't care as long as, given the amount of data that you presented me with, I have actually found you know, the best predictor or close to the best predictor, given the statistical information that you gave me. So we're trying to solve a very different problem than traditionally they were trying to solve in this field. Now, if you have simple genetic architectures, like it's all determined by these three genes, um, one is probably OK, right? Because you'll find those three genes. And then just by taking some little combinations of the values of those variants, you can get a good predictor. But if something depends on 10,000 different uh, loci in your genome, one is not really going to work, uh, but two does work. OK. So uh, in this field, there's something called the missing heritability problem. So what do we mean by that? Let's take height. So uh, if you take two twins, the two twins, identical twins, raised in somewhat similar environments, maybe not the same family, but somewhat similar environments, they'll differ in height by maybe an inch or something, maybe less. And so from that kind of analysis, you can 
conclude that the total or broad sense heritability of human height uh, is about 80%. So about 80% of the population variance in height is determined by genes. Obviously, if you starve a kid, you don't give them any protein, they're gonna end up much shorter. That's, that's not allowed, okay? We're talking about within some range of decent uh, environmental conditions. The heritability is, is high. Um, you can do a very sophisticated thing and try to figure out how much of that heritability is due to the common variance. So if, you're only, if you only have access to these inexpensive SNP arrays, you're only gonna get at the common variants. There are gonna be some rare variants that escape you. And also maybe there be some, there could be some gene gene effects and things like that that you don't get at. The estimate of the amount of heritability due to common variants and additive effects of those common variants is about 45%. Uh, until recently, the very best anybody could do um, with uh, prediction using GWAS results with hundreds of thousands of people is maybe capture about 16% of the variance. And so there was a big mystery in the field about, oh, this is all this missing heritability here, and there's all this missing heritability here. And what our results do is they close this gap. They get you from this 16% uh, very close to this 45%. Okay. And um, so my claim would be that um, the answer to the missing heritability problem, at least as far as the common variants go, not this part, because this is still not available to us, um, but at least, as far as, the, at least as far as this common variant or SNP-based heritability, the solution to the missing heritability problem is both uh, better data and actually better analysis, better algorithms. Okay, so what did we actually do? Um, here's the objective function again. Uh, if, so if you're not in this field, you don't care about this stuff, but, but you have to go through a bunch of quality control to throw out the individual SNPs that maybe didn't get genotype quite right. Um, I mentioned that we transform all the variables into standardized variables, so there's z-score. And uh, sometimes you have effects like, um, if you have a half million people in your data set, some might have been born 20 or 30 years before some of the other people. And it turns out in England, people got taller over this time, probably because nutrition got better. And so you need to correct for that too. Yeah, 20, 30 years is not enough time for any kind of genetic effect or genetic evolution to have occurred, so it must be some environmental effect, and you need to, you need to correct for that. Okay. So our training set is typically a very big set, like 400,000 people, 450,000 people. To implement our algorithm, we need a small holdback set. This holdback set is actually used to uh, determine what this penalization parameter lambda has to be. And then to validate the predictor at the end, and this is familiar in machine learning, you'd like to have some out of sample data. You'd like to have some totally different data and see if you can predict the heights of those people. Okay. So here are the results for height, um, trained on 450,000 people. Um, this is, uh, we presented this data with only 2,000 people here. So these are 2,000 people not involved who are not using the training, okay? And the reason we just chose 2,000, because if you plot, obviously we have many more people, but if you plot more, what happens is the density of these points becomes so high that your eye can't really sense uh, what the contrast, and what the shape of the density function is. So 2,000 is about right, because you can see most of the people are clustered, you know, close to this line, and not so many people are off the line. These error bars are computed by taking a bin of people and just calculating on a much bigger data set uh, the standard deviation within that bin. And the typical size of this error bar is something like, as I said, three centimeters, okay? Red dots are women, are females, blue dots are males. And one way to summarize this is that if, if you go to a crime scene and the detectives hand me some DNA and we don't know who the killer is, but we go to our lab and we genotype genotype the DNA and then we run it through our algorithm, we can tell the detective that the killer was 6'4 uh, plus or minus one inch. Okay. And um, uh, I think that's pretty amazing. Okay, when I, I mean, as an old physicist who started doing this seven years ago, uh, you know, I knew we were gonna get here, but, but of course uh, it, it, took, it took much longer than I had hoped. <laughs> You predict that the very tall will be shorter and the very short will be taller. That's a sampling? No, you can, you can certainly make a mistake. So you, yeah. you, you, you can. All, all 
Oh, are you talking about some systematic? Yeah. yeah. If, if you look, if you look, it, it looks like this is actually tilted a little bit relative to the trend line or something. We we actually got exercised over this and started thinking like, uh, oh, maybe there's some easy correction we can make to our predictor to improve things. But he's he knows, so it doesn't. It it, it actually you can't. You you'll just if you try to do anything to improve what the machine did, you'll always make things worse because the machine actually optimized. Um, so anyway. Um, Yes. So for this population, for this particular population, what is the heritability like? So um, the the stip based heritability is about 0 0.5, 0 0.45, 0 0.5. Uh, are you familiar with GCTA? Yeah. Okay. So if you run GCTA on the data on different populations, you typically get about 0 0.45 to 0 0.5, some somewhere in that region. <laughs> now we can get pretty close to that. We can get correlation up close to about 0.65, I think. And so we can account for maybe 40% of the variance, maybe. Um, I'll show you this curve. So this is uh, what happens if you do exactly what I was describing before, but you do it with different training size training sets. And you can see there's kind of asymptotic behavior. So you know it looks like we're getting diminishing returns. And we are actually close to saturating the predicted heritability. Okay. This is bone density. So uh, they actually, in the UK Biobank, they have measurements of 500,000 people. Um, I don't know if it's an x-ray or a sonogram or something done to the heel of these people. It measures how dense the bones are, their bones are. And that's also pretty heritable. And you can see we're close to you know, optimizing a SNP-based predictor for that, too. This one's actually more medically relevant because uh, people who have low bone density, it is claimed in the medical literature, which I generally don't trust, but it is claimed that uh, if you have low bone density, you're particularly uh, susceptible to osteoporosis as you get older. So that one, this one actually has some, you know, medical applications. Okay. Um, well, one of my one of our collaborators, co-authors, doesn't like this language, but I'm going to use it. This is a rough sketch of the genetic architecture for human height. So, in other words, if I took all your chromosomes and I laid them out end to end, and I just put a base pair coordinate on the horizontal axis, these are the effect sizes in standard deviation units. If it's positive, it means the minor allele, having the minor allele makes you a little bit taller. If it's negative, it means having the minor allele makes you a little bit shorter. Okay? And it's basically, our predictor is so trivial, it's just adding up all these things. You measure the state of the person on all those 20,000 variants and you just add them up. But we, you know, it does okay. Okay, now out of sample validation, um, we had another data set available to us which was American, so not British people, but uh, we filtered so it was all Europeans, your people of primarily European heritage. Uh, these were people who were assembled, I think, for a heart disease study. Um, they were raised in a completely different environment than the British people, actually a different continent, uh, different diet, different period of time. Uh, Predictor still does well in this population, the worst problem that we had to face is that the ARIC people were genotyped with a different array than the UK Biobank people, and we had to do something called imputation to actually relate the, 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 the states on the predictor that we cared about to what was measured in this group. And that actually, I think, was responsible for the most um, loss of predictive power. But we still do well in this out of sample group. And I guess we've now received several confirmations from other groups that they've replicated our results. So 23andMe claims to have replicated our stuff and I think some other, I mean even just a random grad student who happens to actually know how to run Lasso <laughs> can replicate our results. And we, I think we got one such email like that from Harvard or something, right? So, um, yeah. Did you study pi male before the election? Could you say again? Sorry. Did you study pi male before the election? So, good question. So, uh, when we z-score, we z-score everybody relative to their gender mean and relative to their gender standard deviation, and then we compute like that. But to make these plots, because it's cooler, we, we, we undo that so you can see the men and women separately. Okay, we, so we only the z-score do this, yeah. We yeah. Don't, we don't do two separate. Uh, we, we, don't, we do not in our training, but to make this plot, okay. we, we did use the knowledge of the gender of the person to reverse the z-score. Okay, um, this is displaying the phase transition behavior a little bit. So as you vary this parameter lambda, um, this is the number of hits that are activated in the predictor 
Um, and this is how well the predictor does. And you can see there's very sharp behavior like this. So uh, as we move along this curve, we're varying this penalization parameter. And you can see there's a critical range that if you vary it, you get a very sharp response in the optimization. Okay, so I mentioned we've done height, we've done bone density. I think we claim to have the best BMI predictor in the world. Is that true? Sure. Well, at least better than anybody else has published, right? The best educational attainment predictor, I think we can do hair color. I don't know. Did we do baldness or we just know we can do baldness because somebody else published? Well, anyway, we can probably do baldness. We can do grip strength. These are all just weird phenotypes that are in the UK Biobank data. And there's enough data that if you run our code on it, you can get decent predictors. Okay. Um, my guess is that even for the most complex traits, if the heritability is in this ballpark, um, you know, if you, if you have a million a border million, could be a little bit less, could be a little bit more uh, individuals and you have their phenotypes, you should be able to solve these, solve these uh, traits to get good predictors for them. And so one that uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about is cognitive ability, um, which is also highly heritable. Um, and the one that uh, the NIH people care about is, of course, disease risk. I'll talk about that. Steve? Yeah. Does your method, you dropped the quadratic term. Is that because your method doesn't You mean the GG term? Yes. It, your method doesn't work on that, or have you tried it? So, um, so remember when I wrote that function expansion out, it was yeah. GG, and then there was a tensor ZIJ that sat there. So if you think about how many terms there are in Z, yeah. okay, it could be 10 to the 6 squared. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, if Z is sparse, say it's block diagonal or something, there's some locality in your genome so that the SNPs that interact tend to be closer to each other. If, to, if Z turns out to have a nice structure like that, we've actually written papers on what, how to generalize this technique to that case. If you're not in the case where Z is sparse, if Z is actually maximally not sparse, then you're kind of dead. I just, not enough data in the universe to actually get Z. But uh, we are going, you know, we're, we, we hope to get to that. We've actually done a bunch of tests for looking for nonlinear effects and things like that. But I think the surprising thing for most people coming into this just completely cold is that the additive part can be so powerful. And for those of you who are interested in evolution, there is a very deep reason why the additive part can capture so much variance. And it actually, um, there's a famous guy called Fisher who wrote a book called The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection. And you could even say that Darwin understood evolution at an intuitive level, but Fisher was the first one to actually understand it at a mathematical level. And there's a theorem called Fisher's Fundamental Theorem of Natural Selection, and which concerns the rate of adaptation to selection pressure. And the right-hand side, he proved, the dominant term in the right-hand side for sexually reproducing species is the additive variance term. So there's a very good reason why we expect just purely additive effects, which mathematically look totally trivial to us. There's a very good deep evolutionary reason why we expect lots of additive variance in a population. And it's been known for a long time, but not appreciated think, by, by people in this field. Okay, um, I want to say something about how we estimate the sparsity for these traits, okay? And I did it a long time ago, because <laughs> when I was deciding whether to get into this field, I had already estimated, you know, for the really complicated traits that maybe 10K was the right answer. But here I just, I'm gonna quote from this paper which just came out, uh, 2017, this guy's from Johns Hopkins. And I, I quote this paper, not because they're doing anything, anything exceptionally special, but because they cover a lot of traits, and I'll show you the results they get. And the basic idea is like this. If you are doing a GWAS of a bunch of, with a bunch of different phenotypes in it, you'll recover a bunch of associated SNPs. And for each SNP, you'll have the minor allele frequency, so how common is the minor or the rare allele, and then you'll have some effect size associated with that SNP that the GWAS determines. And so even though you haven't found by uh, any stretch of the imagination all the SNPs, um, that are associated with the trait, you, you've, start, you've started to find some of them. And you can just extrapolate that curve. You can just, in the dumbest way, extrapolate that curve and then integrate under it until you recapture all the heritability you think should be there. Okay? And if you do that, you get some crude estimates for the, the sparsity for that trait. How many, how many variants you expect to actually be involved in determining individual differences in this trait. And so these guys are kind of doing that in a more sophisticated way. And I just want to show you their results just because they cover a lot of things. Um, I'll show you the graph. Okay, 
So, sorry you can't read this, but these are traits. Uh, so the, the, the vertical axis is the, the sort of number density of SNPs. Um, the effect size of the SNP uh, is the distance, is the coordinate on the horizontal axis. So most SNPs have, which have non-zero effects have kind of small effects. A few rare ones have big effects. And sort of the area under these curves is proportional to the sparsity, okay? And just to read you the variety of things they looked at, BMI, height, hip circumference, waist circumference, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, triglycerides, childhood IQ, childhood obesity, infant head circumference, intelligence, neuroticism, okay? And you can see there's differences. These, these things have different genetic architectures, but when you actually go and integrate to figure out how many, what is the sparsity for any one of these traits, they're not that different from each other. So my prediction based on these results or some older results that I had uh, are that you know, cognitive ability will be a bit harder than height, but maybe two or three times harder. So if you had a million people and you had good phenotypes for them, you had all their SAT scores or something, you could, you could actually build a pretty good cognitive ability predictor. Okay, and the same would be true for even the most complex disease. Okay, this is taken from a website called, a web page called Snippedia, which is, I think is maintained by NIH. And they just give a list of bunch of traits, most of these are disease conditions, but not all of them, most, I think most of them are though. And then the, the estimated heritability and then some references, okay? And you can see that, you know, this is just alphabet, alphabetical. So these are the A's, these are the B's, and it goes down to Z. And if you just look, say, well, remove anything on this list that doesn't have heritability in the ballpark of 0.5. Above 0.5 is really good, a little bit below 0.5, we could probably still do something with it. Um, there's a huge number of these conditions, uh, which are highly heritable. Coronary artery disease, autism, anorexia, Alzheimer's. And so my prediction is, even if these are very complicated, like even if they depend on thousands of causal variants, if you have a case control population, so 500,000 people or 300,000 people have the condition and a bunch of controls, I believe you can build predictors for all these things. Okay, so now, oftentimes when you're talking about disease risk, the data is very different because instead of a quantitative score like how, how many centimeters tall you have, you just have a case control status. You have like, this person made it to 60 and they didn't get this condition, but this person is 60 and they have this condition. So, you, so the data might, the phenotype Y might be zeros and ones. So it's a little bit more complicated to analyze. It turns out there are all kinds of beautiful methods um, that have been developed for just this sort of one-bit problem. And uh, we've done simulations to reproduce what, where the space boundary is uh, for one-bit data. And it's not, that, that 100 is very conservative. Um, it's, it's, it's worse than 30S, but it's not that much worse. It's a bit worse than 30S. Okay. Um, but, the, but the upshot is that any one of these diseases where the heritability is in the 0.5 range, I think by assembling a large enough case control cohort, you could potentially build a predictor for it. Okay, uh, so let me conclude this part and then I just have a couple slides on my favorite phenotype, which is cognitive ability, and then I'll stop. Okay, so um, this is a technical comment. So um, we think these, these estimate, this method of estimating SNP heritability is probably roughly correct because we're, we're getting, we're, we're sort of hitting saturation similar to what these guys predict. Uh, we think heritability can, even for the most complex traits, can be captured in a predictor. We can prospectively estimate how much data we're gonna need to build that predictor. There are lots of examples of quantitative, of, of tractable traits, both quantitative and otherwise. And my, my big complaint for people in this field, like if Francis Collins were standing here, I would say to him, you know, we spent 10 billion on the LHC. There's a, what do we spend on the Large Hadron Collider? $10 billion, something like this. But we, it's not like we built it not knowing what we were gonna find. We, we understood the theory well enough that we could design the thing, and then we, then we had to go and get the money and build it. And even if you say, just you talk about a billion dollar satellite that we put up to look back at the Big Bang, 
we know what sensitivity that satellite needs to see the microwave fluctuations from the Big Bang. We do that before we do the experiment, okay? So this field, I think, is at a point now where you could actually prospectively say, if you give me X dollars and I can accumulate 300,000 people with Alzheimer's disease and genotype them, and then I have a bunch of controls, uh, controls are no problem at this point, um, then I could build you a very good predictor for Alzheimer's disease. And that's how NIH should do its business, not, not the way they currently do their business. So, all right. Um, I'm gonna just say a few things about cognitive ability. Now, forget everything that you've been told about cognitive ability. Um, if I take 100,000 kids, this was actually done, and I give them all tests, and I measure their mathematical ability, I measure their verbal ability, I measure their spatial ability, that's the ability to visualize you know, objects and rotate things. The interesting thing is that, so each, each of these triangles is a person, okay? The interesting thing is all of these abilities are positively correlated, which means that people don't uniformly fill out this hypercube of phase space. They actually populate a kind of narrow ellipse. And the major coordinate of this ellipse is something that psychometricians call the general factor of intelligence. It is the single best compression of the information that you get from all these tests. And colloquially, it is known as IQ. Okay, now, outside this room, IQ is a thoroughly discredited, horrible thing, but this is the data. This is 100,000 kids tested across America, all ninth graders, okay? And there's, there's, there's tons more data like this, okay? So, this is a highly heritable trait. It's actually about as heritable as height, if you look at identical twins who have been raised in different families, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, why couldn't we build a genomic DNA level predictor for this quantity? Okay, well, we certainly can. Okay, so, the current set of polygenic predictors for cognitive ability correlate in about 0.3 with actual cognitive ability. Okay, the one that we've built from UK Biobank correlates about 0.3. Okay, that's kind of good. It turns out that the grade point average of a student at Michigan State correlates about 0.3 with their SAT score. Okay, so it's not, it's not really good, it's not really bad. Actually, for social science, 0.3 is actually considered a pretty high correlation. So it's actually hard to find correlations in social science which are much higher than 0.3, but okay. Um, so here is a, a study that was done using one of the existing, just recently developed polygenic predictors, okay? And uh, here's what they did. So, so there's this polygenic predictor that's been done by this huge collaboration Social Science Genetic Association Consortium, I think that's what it's called. And some of our collaborators are on that. Um, so they have this predictor that actually predicts cognitive ability based on your SNP genotype. And there, is a, there, are some social, there are some social scientists in New Zealand who have been, in, in Dun, uh, this study is called the Dunedin study, D-U-N-E-D-I-N. And they've been following, it's a longitudinal study, so they've been following a thousand New Zealanders of European heritage from childhood through middle age. So all the people in the study are old like me, okay? So we already know what they did in their life, okay? We know what they're, whether they graduated from college. We know whether they got locked up. We know whether they got addicted to drugs. We know, et cetera, okay? So they gave each of the people in the study, each of these dots is 10 people. They gave each of the people in the study a score and this is pre-existing stuff that people in social science were already doing. This is just the latest thing in the stu longitudinal study of this population. Oh, we got a genetic predictor. Let's see if it's any good. Okay, so uh, these are people who grew up in low socioeconomic status families. These are the middle class people. These are the people who grew up in rich families. Um, you'll note that the average polygenic score is lower in the low SES group is average in the middle class group, and it's above average in the upper class group, okay? Um, it is what it is, okay? Social Darwinistic stuff, okay? Can you predict from knowing the polygenic score of an individual whether they will be, say, upwardly mobile or downwardly mobile? Well, this is obviously very 
weak <laughs> data, but there is some signal in here, okay? I think there really is, and I'm pretty sure that as data accumulate and you, you, know, you do a better job of building your, uh, the polygenic predictor, um, all of these clusters are gonna tighten. And so we will reach a point in time where we can actually say some you know, crude thing about someone's potential in life actually just from their DNA, maybe even before they're born. And so uh, I think we're probably five years from that at most, just if you look at the rate the data is accumulating and such. So um, let me just end there because I think that's the, that's the thing which is gonna have the most impact on society. Hard, to hard for us to imagine, but if you, if you flash forward 100 years and think of what is the effect of being able to do this kind of thing gonna have on society, um, it's, it's, it's very dramatic. So let me stop there. Well, let me give you the answer to the second one. The second one's very easy. Okay, so imagine that some academics in this room publish some really good Alzheimer's predictors, heart disease predictors, what, what have you. And imagine that I can go to 23andMe and pay 50 bucks or 100 bucks and get my genotype and then evaluate my Alzheimer's risk. So I can know if I'm a 99th percentile outlier for early onset Alzheimer's. Then I will immediately go to an insurance company and I will take out the biggest, <laughs> fattest policy for my family because I know I'm gonna be worthless by the time I'm 60, whatever it is, okay? I'm gonna have problems. But I know that and the insurance company has no idea, okay? They don't know anything about me. So this is gonna completely destroy slash transform the insurance industry, that is for sure. Most insurance contracts say three conditions. So if you have knowledge of something and don't disclose it, it negates the contract. Right, so the question is, is, is high polygenic risk a pre-existing condition? But the courts are gonna have to figure that out, right? So. <laughs> they might ask you for a blood sample. Well, the eugenics piece, um, I guess I promised a little bit about that in the abstract, so let me just say quickly. There are about a million babies born worldwide each year using IVF in vitro fertilization. And in some places, it's about 1% of all new births are through in vitro fertilization. Without getting all, into all the technical details, it is now common for couples going through IVF to genotype, to not fully genotype, but to do some level of genetic testing on the embryos to select which ones to implant. And of course, uh, the better this stuff gets, the better that kind of genetic screening gets. And you'll soon be in a situation where rich people can get much better outcomes than poor people through going through IVF. That is just a straightforward uh, statement about where the technology is and where it'll be in five years. Um, what's the more right moral thing to do? It's, it's up to you. You're a voter, I'm a voter, we have to vote, we have to make it illegal, or we have to make it subsidized by government. Everybody should have access to it or nobody has access to it. I think there are a lot of positions one could take. So, you, you said that the genotype are called personal correlations, uh, which means that uh, different axes have similar performance. And then you apply your norms to uh, enforce the sparsity. Well, maybe a better uh, performance would be achieved by a set of axes, or uh, uh, some axes which you exclude to the norm. Can you comment on that? I'm not, I'm not sure what you're saying, so... Um, so if there are correlations in, in the uh, genotype, that means you could choose different axes, x vectors, mm -hmm. which would yield the same result. Because the yes, oh, I understand your question, yes. So when you run the lasso algorithm a second time, you don't get the same X optimization. You may get a slightly different X optimization, but of course there, the inner product is quite high between, in a sense, the, the coarse grained inner product between them is quite high. So um, there are many, uh, in detail, in, in a granular level, inequivalent predictors, but actually at some coarse grain level they are equivalent. Does that answer your question? 
one of the places where it strikes me that you might be able to make an improvement on your model without much work with respect to the interaction terms that, that you said by and large are pretty small was, uh, so Charles Darwin was worried about the effects of inbreeding. Uh, his son, George Darwin, the physicist, wrote the first paper showing that consanguinous uh, marriages led to a higher fraction of children in prisons and in insane asylums in the day. Yep. And, so I'm, and that, that's also something that varies geographically. And so I'm wondering if you couldn't have some sort of just additional variable of an index of uh, sort of consanguinous Okay. Yeah, so it's, that would be an easy metric to pull out in terms of excess homozygosity. So there, it's already known from just descriptive studies that uh, you can measure the effect on, say, IQ depression or other things from consanguinity. Is that did I say that right? Consanguinity. Anyway, but th these are known. These are known things for people who study uh, human genetics, actually. No, I know they're known. I'm just wondering if adding that into your model though wouldn't produce a marginal but important improvement in terms but, of identifying if nothing else outliers that might be, in some sense, making the fit. We we haven't tried it, but uh, it might be worth a try. Yes. Um, could you show the plot for uh, predicted height versus actual height in the British sample? Again for a moment. Yep. Okay, so one of the things that struck me about that is it's just barely discernible in the British case, but in the American case, uh, there's a distinct shift between the lines for the women and the lines for the men. So the Americans, uh, the intercept is quite different for women and men, even though they're more or less parallel. Yeah. Is there an explanation for that? Is that nutritional differences between women and men in the US? We don't know. We don't know. Um, it, well, yeah, I, I, best answer is just we don't know. Um, we, I mean, there's there's so much interesting stuff to do in this area. We're kind of like at our limit to like try to figure out, like prioritize what's the next question we should look at. So, yeah. yeah. I have a question oh, about yeah, that. I do have another question about that, which is uh, if you take a given predicted height and you look at the distribution of the actual heights, uh, is it Gaussian all the way out? Or does it just not? So I. I have not, Lou would know the answer to this, but yeah, so, so if you take the predicted height, this is the, this is the width of the Gaussian. I don't know what, whether in the tail, like we've not tested whether there are deviations from normality. Um, I think in general in the population, things that you think are, they're, they're too good approximation normal, yeah. there, there is often excess stuff in the tails. Uh, I do know that for sure. Yeah, I don't want to get uh, too far carried away with it, but I think with cognitive ability, there's an argument that it's log normal. The There's an overpopulation of people in the t it's certainly in the right tail uh, yeah. for cognitive ability. Is that reflected in your? We have not. We haven't looked. We haven't looked. So why is the best way to do an alpha sample validation uh, to have a data set that's a, like European descended? Like why not on Chinese? Or yeah. Good African? question. Yeah. Good question. So. Uh, one of the things that you have to do in this field, uh, because you're, you're trying to detect kind of small statistical effects, is, is you want to get rid of all the confounds that you can, okay? And so if you have uh, two people, uh, if you have people that are from very different ethnic backgrounds and who maybe because of their ethnic backgrounds may have experienced different environments, for example, um, you, you're opening yourself up to those confounds if you, when you do your initial training of the predictor, uh, you include you just include a mix of ethnicities. Okay, so it's actually best practice considered best practice in this kind of work to first find a bunch of people who are si as similar as possible and then train the predictor. Now, when you go and take that trained predictor and you try to use it on a different ethnic group, the problem is the following: we are just detecting statistical associations. Okay, and the the particular SNP may be tagging some genetic variation, which is much more complicated. Okay, but the goodness of that tag will tend to vary between populations. So when we test this predictor, which is trained on Europeans, on non-European populations, there is a decay in predictive power. And the decay in predictive power gets stronger and stronger the larger the genetic distance between the Europeans and the other, the, the, the out-of-sample testing group. So we actually see that. Um, but we think that most people in the field think that there isn't a distinct genetic architecture for height between different ethnicities. It's just that the tagging 
uh, of the true causal variant is worse in the other populations. Because it, it was trained only on one population, but uh, therefore it would underperform on the other populations. I mean, just following up, that strikes me as a really interesting, important future direction is, is I mean, and there are two reasons it might decay as you move to another, probably three or four reasons. But one is just the allele frequencies differ. It's something that might be moderately common in European population might be non-existent in a particular subpopulation. So of course, it sort of loses power. The other is that there might actually be a change in the underlying biology. And it strikes me that the approach you're taking can easily tease these apart once the data sets get big enough. I don't know about easily, but could suggest hypotheses. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a very important observation that, you know, the amount of variance accounted for is proportional to, you know, it depends on the minor allele frequency. So if you if you have a thing where there's just a lot of, you know, there's a very common minor allele in this population, so it gets tagged really fast in the optimization, and over here it turns out everybody's fixed on that uh, allele, then your predictor break, your predictor just doesn't work there. So, um, yeah, these are all things that we, we want to look at. More question, which is, um, with the SNPs that you're looking at, are they distributed uniformly between the DNA that's known to be in genes and the DNA that previously was referred to as junk DNA? That's a good question, yeah. Functional? So, um, a lot of people I talk to, you know, if I go to a university and I look for the, you know, it says above their office door, genomics expert, <laughs> expert or editor at nature, you know, and I go and talk to them, maybe that's at a meeting or something. Um, and I ask them, this is like five years ago, okay, or seven years ago, and I was just trying to figure out, is this something worth doing, okay? I would talk to the expert, and the expert would say to me many times, oh, forget about the intragenic regions. You, you just need to, everything's gonna be clustered around the genes. And furthermore, the salesperson from Illumina, which makes all the sequencers, would say to you, oh, you should just do exotic sequencing. Oh, what's exonic sequencing? Well, you sequence the exons. Oh, what are the exons? Well, it means that you save genotyping costs because you only sequence the part that's just right around the genes and you don't have to do anything more because everything else is junk. So this was, you know, again, people will deny this now. People will deny that they ever thought this way, but I, I am 100% sure people did think this way. And the answer is no. <laughs> the, the, the junk DNA is not junk. And the, there's, there's all kinds, I mean, if you think about how complex we are, it has to be the case. There's some control stuff which could be quite somewhat far away from the gene, which is doing something interesting. And that I think that's kind of what you find. Do you have any intention to get into epigenetics eventually? Uh, sure, yeah, yes, but, but we're trying to solve the easiest. So that's another, the secret of physicists is always solve, always figure out what are the, what's the low hanging fruit, what can be solved you know, in a foreseeable way, and solve that. And then if it gets too complicated, leave it to the really strong people to continue on. <laughs> but so epigenetics, you know, that, in my own thinking, that may be like really hard to figure out, whereas we're just kind of get, getting the cheap low-lying fruit here. Carla, did you have one more? So uh, anything you can learn in the text of biology, and once you have the 5,000, I mean, yeah. names, I mean, you so, yeah, so there's a whole group of people who have developed all this code that, and even there, there's all kinds of interesting machine learning, where, where the machine, maybe the machine learning is even just like reading the literature, okay? And they will do things like, uh, they have a way, I don't even really understand how it works, but there, there are these funny acronyms for these software packages that people have developed, where you just throw your stuff in there and it tells you, um, yeah, actually, this thing is expressed in this pathway and uh, it's interesting for this reason and all that is, you know, beyond me, but, but, uh, but for sure people are doing it. Like our collaborators at the SSGAC, the ones who study cognitive ability and stuff like that, they have done all this stuff which shows that the SNP hits that they've found are very strongly expressed in like the nervous system and, and the brain and all this other stuff, so. Uh, but I, I don't understand any of that myself. Okay, so just so we're not inundated by the next seminar that's coming in, we should end here and let people go. But if you have more questions, I'm sure you would. Sure. <laughs>